We talked last week about how prophets roam the country in bands or what we call schools and how Elijah's school had probably been wiped out by Jezebel. Elijah is exhausted, but the Lord has compassion for him. The Lord tells Elijah that it's time to appoint a successor. Now, I'm reading between the lines here, but I suspect Elijah had a star disciple in his school, someone he knows really well and in whom he sees the spirit of the Lord at work. So he heads out to this disciple's home. We haven't met this disciple yet. His name is Elisha, and he's a wealthy man. When Elijah catches up with him, Elisha is out plowing in his field, not with a small plow and a pair of oxen like most normal folks, but with 12 pair, that's 24 oxen. So this is a huge, possibly commercial farming operation. Elijah goes up to Elisha and throws his cloak around him. And Elisha immediately understands that this means he's to take Elijah's place as the leader of Elijah's school of prophets and that Elijah is setting out to build up his school again. Back then, passing the mantle wasn't just a metaphor, it was literal. Remember when the prophet Ahijah tore his cloak into 12 pieces and gave 10 pieces to Jeroboam? He was literally passing the mantle of David, albeit in pieces. Elisha knows that if he accepts this mantle, he'll be putting his life on the line. Once they surface, Jezebel will be after them in full force. So Elisha says, let me go tell my folks goodbye, and then I will come to you. And so Elisha goes home. He breaks the news to his folks that he's about to put himself into mortal danger, and he's shutting down his farming operation completely. Elisha chops up his plowing equipment, slaughters and cooks his oxen, and gives the meat to his workers. Then he sets out to follow Elijah. Meanwhile, things are not going so well for King Ahab. Ben-Hadad, king of Aram, has gathered a co huge coalition of 32 other kings with their horses and chariots and is attacking Samaria, Ahab's capital. These are likely all the kings of the various city-states that make up Aram who have already been conquered by Ben-Hadad or whom are allies or vassals. Ben-Hadad sends word to Ahab, your silver and gold are mine and the best of your wives and children are mine. And Ahab with his back to the wall says, fine, take them. But Ben-Hadad presses again saying, by this time tomorrow, I will take over your very palace and the houses of your officials. We will seize everything of value that we find. Well, this is more than Ben-Hadad asking for more tribute or taxes from Ahab. This is a full on takeover. King Ahab consults with the elders of Israel and they decide this is a bridge too far. They might as well fight Ben-Hadad, even if it all looks hopeless. So King Ahab replies, I was willing to give you gold, silver, wives and children as tribute, but this last demand I cannot meet. Do your worst. And Ben-Hadad says, May the gods deal with me ever so severely if there is enough real estate in Samaria to hold all the soldiers I'm going to send. And Ahab answers, he who puts on his armor should not boast like one who has taken it off. And so Ahab and the forces of Israel prepare for battle with Ben-Hadad and the 32 kings. At that very moment, a prophet comes to Ahab and says, this is what the Lord says. Do you see Ben-Hadad's vast army? I will give it into your hand today so that you will know that I am the Lord. If you've been in a class since the beginning, you may have the phrase, I am the Lord, circled in 1 Kings 20 verse 13 in your Bible. One of our backpack tools is to notice this phrase. It's used in scripture like boldface type. It shows up when the Lord is saying something particularly important. It's really helpful to circle all of these so they alert you to an important point that you might otherwise breeze right by. It sneaks up on you. I have them circled in my Bible. The Lord is setting up a moment of choosing here. 
for Ahab. The Lord is offering to defeat Ben-Hadad's army for the sole purpose of turning Ahab from his idolatry and thus keep Ahab from leading Israel further away from the Lord. The Lord is pursuing his people, even to the point of forgiving Ahab, if Ahab will only recognize that the Lord is God. Ahab says to the prophet, how in the world is this possible? And the prophet says, the young officers of all the militia throughout your kingdom will come to your aid. You just start the battle. The Lord will destroy Ben-Hadad. And so King Ahab calls for all the young officers of all the militia throughout his kingdom to come quickly. In all, 232 officers show up. With them, plus the rest of the forces of Israel, Ahab still only has 7,000 men. Pitiful, hopeless. Nevertheless, Ahab and the 7,000 men set out at noon, while Ben-Hadad and the 32 kings are eating and making merry and getting drunk in their tents. Ben-Hadad's scouts run quickly to tell him the men of Israel are advancing. Ben-Hadad waves his hand, eh, see if they've come in peace. If so, take them alive. If they think they're coming to do battle, snicker, snicker, also take them alive. Either way, they'll be our prisoners. We far outnumber them. But when the forces meet, the young officers and their militia fight bravely and strike down the forces of Ben-Hadad's coalition. The Arameans flee and Ben-Hadad himself barely escapes with his life. Again, the prophet comes to King Ahab and says, you must strengthen your position. Ben-Hadad has fled for now, but in the spring when kings go to war again, he'll be back with another force to strike you. Meanwhile, back at home in Aram, Ben-Hadad's advisors are telling him, the gods of the Israelites are worshiped on the high places. They are gods of the hills. This battle is on the hills, so that must be why we lost. We must change strategies. Switch out the kings you take next time. Raise another big army and plan an attack on the plains rather than the hills. Then you will be victorious. And so the next spring, when it is again time for war, the two armies go out to battle. The army of the Arameans is vast, covering the whole countryside, while the army of Israel seems no bigger than two small flocks of goats. The man of God comes again to King Ahab and says, this is what the Lord says, because the Arameans think I am only God of the hills and not God of the valleys, I will deliver this vast army into your hands. Ben-Hadad will be destroyed. When you, then you will know that I am the Lord. There's that phrase again, I am the Lord. This is a pivotal moment. Ahab must choose whether to recognize that the Lord is God over him and over Israel and the Lord God is his protection. For seven days, the two armies camp opposite each other. And on the seventh day, the battle is joined. Within 24 hours, the tiny army of Israel inflicts 100,000 casualties on the Aramean foot soldiers. Those who escape flee to the city of Afek, where the walls of the city fall on them and 27,000 more soldiers perish. Knowing he's been defeated, Ben-Hadad runs for his life and hides in an inner room in the city. There, his officials say, Look, we've heard that the kings of Israel are merciful. Let us beg for mercy on your behalf. And so Ben-Hadad's officials put on sackcloth and hang ropes around their heads as prisoners would do. And they go to King Ahab. They say, Ben-Hadad is your servant. Please let him live. And Ahab answers, oh, is he still alive? He's my brother. Go bring him to me. Encouraged, the officials run to get Ben-Hadad and bring him to King Ahab. But knowing the history of what happens to defeated kings, I bet Ahab is going to slaughter Ben-Hadad, right? But no, Ahab actually invites Ben-Hadad up into his royal chariot, honoring him. 
And there the two kings hammer out a peace treaty that favors Israel economically. Now, this totally flabbergasts me. It's definitely not what the Lord had in mind. King Ahab chooses wealth and an alliance with and a dependence on the strength of this foreign king rather than choosing the Lord. When the prophet of God hears this, he is overcome by the Holy Spirit. He turns to one of the other disciples in his school and says, quick, wound me with your sword. But the other disciple says, no, are you nuts? And the prophet of God says, you will regret not obeying the voice of the Lord. When you leave me today, a lion will kill you. And sure enough, as soon as they part, a lion kills that disciple. So the prophet of God finds another man and says, quick, strike me with your sword and wound me. That man obliges. And so the prophet of God goes to stand by the road where King Ahab will soon pass. The prophet is covered with blood, but even still he pulls a headband down over his eyes so King Ahab won't recognize him. Now we don't know if this is Elijah or Elisha or some other prophet. The prophet is never named, but it's clearly somebody King Ahab knows well. So it definitely could be um, Elijah or and presumably Elisha. When Ahab passes by, the prophet calls out, I was in a battle and someone came to me with a prisoner and said, guard this man for if he goes missing, you will pay for it with your own life or with a talent of silver. But I got distracted and the prisoner escaped. And King Ahab says, you've condemned yourself with your own mouth. Let it be as you have said. The prophet whips off his headband and reveals his identity and says, this is what the Lord says. You have freed Ben-Hadad, whom I had determined should die. Therefore, it is your life for his life and your people for his people. Ahab's face falls when he hears this. He knows now that he's about to suffer the consequences of his choices. Sullen and angry, he returns to his palace in Samaria. Now, sometime later, Ahab decides he wants a particular vineyard belonging to a man named Naboth, who lives up in the Jezreel Valley close to Ahab's palace. Ahab offers Naboth either an exchange of land or payment, whichever he prefers. But Naboth refuses to sell him the vineyard, saying, this is my family's inheritance in Israel. I cannot sell it to you. So Ahab goes back to the palace and sulks. He literally pouts in his room like a teenager and refuses to eat anything. Finally, Jezebel comes in and asks him what on earth is the matter? And when Ahab tells her, she says, are you kidding me? You are the king of Israel. Get up and eat. I'll handle this. And she writes letters in Ahab's name, instructing the elders of Israel to proclaim a day of fasting. She writes, make sure to seat Naboth in a place of honor and seek two of your men across from him. Then have them swear that while they were sitting there, Naboth cursed God and cursed King Ahab. Then take Naboth out and stone him to death. Gee whiz, no wonder Jezebel has a re reputation that her, so much that her name has come to be synonymous with wickedness. Goodness. And the leaders of Israel, they're no better. They do exactly as Jezebel instructs them. As soon as Jezebel receives word that Naboth is dead, she tells Ahav to go out and take possession of Naboth's land. The Lord, however, knows all that is done in secret, and whatever we do in darkness will be revealed in the light. The Lord has Elijah go to meet Ahav. Ahab says, ha, you have found me, my enemy. And Elijah says, yes, yes, I have, because you have sold yourself to evil. The Lord says, I am going to bring disaster on you. I will consume your descendants. Every last male in your house will be cut off. Dogs will eat those who die in the city and birds will feed on those who die in the country. Your house will be like that of Jeroboam and of Baasha, 
because you have provoked me to anger and you have caused my people to sin. Furthermore, Jezebel will also perish and dogs will devour her by the wall of Jezreel. 1 Kings 21-25 says there never was a man like Ahab who sold himself to do evil, urged on by Jezebel, his wife. It says he behaved in the vilest manner and pursued idols. So what happens next? The Lord smites him and Jezebel, right? Well, no. You see, Ahav repents. For real. It's one of the most amazing 180s in all of scripture. The arrogant, evil King Ahav puts on sackcloth and ashes and starts acting with humility. So the Lord relents and says, I will not bring disaster on Ahab during his lifetime, but it will come when his son becomes king. So for three years, there's peace between Aram and Israel. But by year three, the treaty between Ben-Hadad and King Ahab begins to fail. Ben-Hadad apparently reneges on his promise of favorable trade concessions, and King Ahab begins to think about attacking and taking the city of Ramoth Gilead back from the Arameans. Since King Ahab is not strong enough to do this himself, he puts out feelers to King Jehoshaphat in Judah. Now, King Jehoshaphat in Judah comes to the throne after his father, King Assad, dies. And he's been following God to the best of his ability ever since. He set up honest judges and even sent out officials, Levites and priests to teach the people about God. And God has given Judah peace during his reign. But now King Ahav is tempting him with the offer of a powerful alliance in order to defeat the most dangerous enemy in the region. Any alliance with Ahav is bound to be an unholy one. Will Jehoshaphat be able to resist the pull of this temptation? Well, I hate to tell you this, but the answer is no. King Jehoshaphat falls under the spell of King Ahab. He even makes a marriage alliance with him, allowing his son Jehoram to marry Ahab's daughter, Athaliah. The two kings meet to discuss a joint campaign. Ahav presses Jehoshaphat to join him in war against Aram, but Jehoshaphat says, first we must ask the Lord. So King Ahav says, oh, no problem. And he calls in all his prophets and they immediately say, yes, go to war against the Arameans. The Lord will give Ramoth Gilead into your hands, O great King Ahav. I can just see the skeptical look and the side eye King Jehoshaphat gives King Ahav. He says, uh-huh, right. Um, is there any real prophet of God around here? And King Ahav says, well, there's this one guy, but I hate him. He never says anything good about me. And King Jehoshaphat says, sheesh, you're the king. You shouldn't say things like that. So King Ahav calls for this prophet whose name is Micaiah. You can imagine the scene. There's two kings sitting on their thrones and all Ahav's prophets are prophesying his great victory and dancing around in a frenzy. One of them, a guy named Zedekiah, has made iron horns as a prancing around, pretending to gore folks saying, this is how you will gore the Arameans. And th this totally makes me think of that guy with the horns from the attack on the Capitol on January 6th, right? The messenger that's been sent to fetch the prophet Micaiah tells him what's going on and says, you know the drill, Micaiah, just keep your head down and tell King Ahav whatever he wants to hear. And Micaiah's like, yeah, you know that doesn't work. I'll try, but the Lord always ends up forcing me to tell Ahav the truth. Poor Micaiah. So Micaiah arrives at the threshing floor where the kings and the court and the prophets are all set up. King Ahav says, Micaiah, shall we go to war against Ramoth Gilead or not? And Micaiah, Micaiah says, oh yes, attack and be grandly victorious, O king, for the Lord will give you victory. And King Ahav sighs and says, how many times do I have to tell you, Micaiah, stop with the BS, swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in the name of the Lord. Micaiah takes a breath and says, all right, Here's the truth. 
I see all of Israel scattered across the hills like sheep without a shepherd. And the Lord says, these people have no master. Send them home in peace. And King Ahav turns to King Jehoshaphat and says, see, I told you he never has anything good to say about me. You can just see Micaiah rolling his eyes, but the Lord's not done yet. Micaiah continues, I saw the Lord sitting on his throne with a, all the host of heaven standing around him. And the Lord said, which one of you will entice Ahav into attacking Ramoth Gilead and going to his death there? And one suggested this and the other suggested that. And finally, a spirit came forward and said, I will entice him. I will cause all his prophets to lie to him. And the Lord says, do it. He'll totally fall for that. Now, as an aside, remember that this entire story is cast in a form that is traditional in this ancient culture. We have lots and lots of stories from the ancient Near East that are set up in a similar manner, where the gods have a council to decide what to do about humans, and thus an adventure is set in motion. Don't build a theology up out of this. Don't turn flips trying to explain how the Lord could send a lying spirit to do his dirty work. You'd just be trying to fight your way out of the wrapping paper and would miss the entire point of the story. We have to take the format of the story and understand it within its historical context. These ancient peoples understood gods to make decisions like this in groups and to interfere with humans in exactly this way by tricking them. And the Israelites quite naturally transferred this cultural understanding of gods in general directly to Yahweh. We are hearing this story in their words. God's been working on him to try to make him understand that he's a different sort of God, but so far they're not getting it. And in this story, we can actually see how thin the veneer is. They may give lip service to Yahweh, but they still cling to a pagan understanding of how gods, plural, work. And they still believe gods, even Yahweh, are manipulative, selfish, and capricious at that. So with that aside, let's go back to the story. Micaiah has just called all of Ahav's prophets liars. Zedekiah, the one with the horns, steps up and slaps Micaiah and says, oh yeah, and which way did the lying spirit from the Lord go when he passed from me to you, you liar? And Micaiah says, you'll know the answer to that on the day you go hide for your life in an inner room. King Ahav says, enough, enough take Micaiah and send him over to the king of Ammon, that's not Aram, Ammon, as in Ammonites, not Arameans, send him over to the king of Ammon and tell him to keep Micaiah in jail until I return safely from this blasted war. And as they drag Micaiah away, Micaiah cries, if you ever return safely, then I am not a prophet of God. Mark my words, people. And so the kings of Israel and Judah march out to, attach, to attack Ramoth Gilead. King Ahav says to King Jehoshaphat, uh, just to be extra safe, I'll go in disguise. I mean, after all, Micaiah did prophesy that my people would be leaderless, which means he thinks I'm going to be killed. So I'll go in a disguise, but you go ahead and wear your regular kingly robes so the men can see you leading them. We don't want the men to lose heart. So that's what they do. And sure enough, during the battle, when the Arameans see King Jehoshaphat dressed in his kingly robes in his chariot, they think he's King Ahab and start to attack him. But when they get close enough to see that he's not Ahab, they stop pursuing him. They don't care about the king of Judah. They want to kill Ahab, king of Israel. But they can't find him since he's disguised. So Ahab is safe, right? Uh, no. The Lord knows exactly where Ahav is. Ahav had a chance and Ahav has made his choice. He's about to suffer the consequences of removing himself from the Lord's protection. A random arrow strikes King Ahav between the sections of his armor and mortally wounds him. The king calls to his chariot driver, wheel around and get me out of the fighting. 
All day long, the battle rages. King Ahav, propped up in his chariot, watches as the battle as his lifeblood slowly drains away. Finally, as the sun sets, the battle is called off. The men realize their king has died and a cry spreads through the army, every man to his town, everyone to his own land. And so King Ahab dies and is buried in Samaria. They wash all the blood out of his chariot at a pool in Samaria where prostitutes bathed. And there dogs lick up his blood just as the Lord declared. And his son Ahaziah succeeds him as king. That brings us to the end of First Kings. Seems like a good stopping place. We've seen some shocking turnarounds these last couple of weeks. First, Solomon's son, King Rehoboam, listened to the prophet Shemaiah and lay down his arms and didn't attack northern Israel, remember? And now today, the thoroughly wicked King Ahav repents, even though it didn't last long. In our breakout groups today, we're going to explore the concept of repentance. But the questions were all about repentance, and we started out with some definitions. There, there's two words for repentance in, in Hebrew. One of them, uh, shva, which means retirement, withdrawal, or returning. To return is its primary meaning and includes restoring, uh, reversing, relinquishing, backing away. The other word is nacham, uh, which means to be sorry or regretful, to be consoled or to be comforted, to sigh deeply as in either relief or sorrow. And the, one, the word we're most familiar with is the Greek word in the New Testament, metanoia, which means to change one's mind and feel compunction and to make amends. So um, with that background, the um, first question was, uh, what seems to be the main elements of true repentance? And a corollary of that is, did any of these definitions surprise you? I think that there was one that was left off in that definition. Which Julia, can you move a little closer because I'm having a hard time hearing you. Oh, okay, sorry. There's one in our family that's not on the list and that's contrition, mm. you know, being truly contrite and and wanting to make it better. That's a great well, word. One of the definitions that Gail said was included the word regret. And I sort of think of that as similar to compunction. Yeah. Yeah. And so, yeah. Yeah. Okay. And one of the things that our group talked about is restoration. I mean, do we, you know, the scripture talks in Ephesians about if someone who is stolen, steal no more. You know, when you come to a place of forgiveness. Um, and so, you know, we are looking at Ahab and the whole idea of, you know, his, his repentance, but we don't, you know, we had this conversation, we didn't see anything in scripture that talked about Ahab going back to Nabed's house, hold, and making some form of restitution, you know, to the end of what he took, you know, he took his entire field, he took Nabed's life through his wife, you know, um, so we just found that was an interesting, I never thought about that until we saw it today. It seems to me it's all about what's in your heart. Yeah. And when Ahab um, repented what he had done, uh, it, on the surface of it, it didn't look like he was really honest about it in, in, in his heart, but the, the Lord did forgive him in effect. So obviously the Lord can see what's in our heart. So um, I, I mean, you can't, I don't think Ahab was fooling, <laughs> fooling the Lord. Mm -hmm. So, um, mm -hmm. but it all goes back to what's in your heart. Yeah. Not just what you do. Yeah. yeah. I, I agree with Woody. We were also talking about how from like the, obviously Eric and I joined the Bible study late, but from the themes that we saw of Saul, of Jonathan, of David, you know, um, David's sons, they're you're just the continued theme of uh, of humility like that that humility piece has uh, just such a big role in almost all of the king's stories at some point uh whether they are humble in a moment and then go back and then it becomes a, 
a mess again or whether they are able to remain in that kind of humble stature before the Lord and essentially making some type of statement of you're God and I'm not. Absolutely. And I like the idea that repentance is directional. Um, it's not a state. It is a path. It's directional. Um, I think the the what Whitty was bring was bringing out too um, was that Ahav had this you know moment of clear sackcloth and ashes and repentance and and the Lord yeah. saw it and it was obviously genuine. You know the Lord yeah. responded to that. Um, we probably would look, would have looked at Ahav and said, "You're right," uh, you know, but, but, but the Lord saw his heart as wicked. The Bible said he's the wickedest one there was, and the Lord still said, "I'll accept your repentance," you know. No. But the whole point is turning around and going the other direction because the Lord was trying to get Ahav to stop leading the people away from the Lord and start leading the people to the Lord. Um, so, so did the second question had to do with, um, does any part of any of these words or any of what we've seen in all of scripture so far imply punishment? One of the things we said was it depends on how yeah, broadly yeah. or narrowly you define punishment. Mm -hmm. All right, well, say some more about that. Well, Joe brought up um, Catholic confession, for example, um, or, or you know, some sort of buying, yeah. buying repentance. Well, if, you know, if you have to, whatever you have to do, whether it's pay money uh, or say 10 whole Mary, Hail Marys or whatever it is, does, does that, does what you have to do, is that kind of a form of sort of punishment or it's, you're, you're giving up something, whether you're giving up your time or your money or something. So um, I mentioned that th this whole Bible study with you is a new kind of background for me in God's mercy, because no, these stories don't mention punishment. Um, when you are repenting, you know, he doesn't say, okay, but you messed up. So now go give up 10 goats or, and I said, but I grew up in this very Catholic setting that even though my church didn't preach it, that I was surrounded by people who talked about saying 10 Hail Marys and, you know, confessionals and paying your penance. And so then that's when we got into the, the thing about what about yourself you know, like Woody said, well, but maybe that means that you, you know, give up something of yourself, as you said, to a correctional action. But at the end, basically, we still came back to, uh, no, he just wants us to know I am the Lord. And Woody said, you know, we all agreed, it's hard for us to define, rep to discuss repentance now without jumping to the New Testament. Yeah. Yeah. But in Old Testament systems, when you repented, I don't, we don't see a punishment. Well, we, you know, our group talked about a punishment indirectly. Uh, the consequence, I think more than a punishment, he lost his wife. He lost Jezebel in the process. You know, now was that a direct result of, of him repenting? And that was the consequences of him? I don't know. Gail, what do you think about that? Well, actually Jezebel um, outlives Ahav. So she does not die till later. Um, oh, I didn't know that. I thought she died right then and there. She didn't? Well, unless I've got it backwards, which is entirely possible. But <laughs> I think I think, no, I, she, think so. I think she actually outlives him. Um, he dies I in that battle. That. And, um, and, and you're I, right. You're, and you're I, right. Yeah. And I think that um, we have not, I have, I have not seen anywhere the Lord ever punish somebody when they repented. Agreed. I I have we have seen unrepentant people over and over and over and over, and the Lord says, "I'm going to stop protecting you. I'm going to stop protecting you. I'm going to stop protecting you." Okie doke. I'm stopping protecting you. You know, and then yeah. 
they suffer the consequences of their actions. And we have not seen the Lord, you know, striking fire down on someone. It's been more, you know, the, the rain just stops coming and they have famine or whatever, you know, um, or they, they suffer the consequences of relying on another nation's strength rather than the Lord's. And oh, the, what, the other nation's about, strength is always going to be worse. Yeah, Julie. Well, I'm just thinking about David when he uh, slept with Bathsheba and their baby died. I thought that that was a punishment. Good yes, point. very good. That that actually did seem to be a punishment, didn't it? It it did it seem to be. Yeah. Why would that have been different? Because he hadn't repented about that relationship. Possibly. That's that's entirely possible. He did keep Bathsheba. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, also so in this in the story today, was it? Uh, uh, was it Jehosh Jehoshaphat or Ahab uh, who, who, after he repented, the Lord said, "Okay, I won't bring down this punishment on him, but I will on his uh, children, on his son." Yeah, that was Ahab, and and his yeah. son Ahaziah was as wicked as Ahab had been. So the Lord is is simply going to let Ahaziah suffer the consequences of yeah. his own, you know choices it could also be a delay in the consequences that ahav has built up that the lord's not going to interfere with but the point i think in that story was the lord showed mercy to maha to ahav mm -hmm. for repenting you know one of the things we talked about is and this is leading up to the repentance is a form of punishment is the feelings you get inside when you know that you've messed up and you need to make something right, the heaviness in your heart, the thoughts racing through your mind until you make something right, that in itself is sort of a, a form of punishment because until you make that right, it's, it's harmful to your whole being. Yeah, it's, no. but it's a form of suffering the natural consequences. I mean, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm trying to get across the message that except in really, really, really rare circumstances, the Lord just isn't in to beating up on us. You know? We sure are. <laughs> yes, we are. Sad because, <laughs> but, but I think it's so sad when we have or at least I have experience in, in Christian faith, this fear that is, that keeps being communicated of like, you know, they'll use natural disasters or hurricanes and specifically like around in the um, New Orleans. And they're like, yep, that's a punishment for their wicked ways. You know, like we hear that constantly in our LGBTQ. religious space. And, and it's, it's, it, it's hard because then you start to question it. Well, maybe... I did do something wrong and this is why I'm, I'm living this or this is why this happened. So it's, it's sad that it has gone twisted when yes, you're right. So far, we haven't seen the Lord. There have been some consequences, but it hasn't been this mighty person being like, this is what you deserve because you did wrong. But that's what we've been taught, it seems like. I agree. No, I agree. And what taught. I think I heard Renee. Yes, sorry. Uh, it is where it is your truth. That is what seems to be taught in most of our churches is that if you mess up, you know, if you're having a hard time, then what did you mess up? Instead yeah. of just bad things happen and it's nobody's fault. That's right. But, and that gets us to, to number three, which was the third question, which is, um, really the most important one, which is how do we know then whether we need to repent of something? Is there a set of rules to apply, a particular scripture passage to point to? How do we know if we're off track? And that's where our group uh, said we have to turn to the New Testament. Oh, so, and what did you say? Uh, love God and love your neighbor. Mm -hmm. yeah. But... But what remains from this story is also, I am the Lord. 
Can yeah. I just and can so I just point out that that New Testament passage was at Jesus directly quoting the Hebrew Bible? FYI. Yeah, yeah. Ah. yeah putting putting two <laughs> passages together. Yeah. You That's know right. that he was quoting the Hebrew Bible and saying that was the whole point of the Hebrew Bible. If you didn't get this out of the Hebrew Bible, you missed the point. Mm -hmm. Of course, yeah, what was the, that verse again? The, the, oh, what was the verse? Yeah. Uh, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. Mm -hmm. um, I, I can't quote you what, what exactly. Uh, verse that was, but um, but the brilliance of Jesus was that he took the entire Hebrew Bible and recognized that those were the not only the most important rules, really, but really the almost the only rules. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And have you all seen that as we've studied the Hebrew Bible? Are you seeing that clearly? That the way I'm presenting these stories to you, I'm trying to make that connection so clear. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's, that, was, that was exactly what I said when we hit like number three is what I'm seeing from Gail, well, and, I, and number two, because I related it back to growing up into the, you know, Hail Mary community is that no, this is not the message from that part of the Bible. I'm definitely getting hit between the eyes with it, Gail. Thank you. <laughs> we we had a discussion in our group about <clears throat> what does love look like in response to that scripture. And one of the things I was commenting on is something that happened in my life this week where I now owe my son an apology. It was a mild thing, but it's not a mild thing. It's, it's big to him and I didn't see it until just now. Mm. And that is, you need to meet people where they are, mm -hmm. not just what you think love is to you, Good. but what love might mean to them. Yes. Oh, it's excellent. Five love languages. Yes. <laughs> well, I think it, Rhonda, will you kick in what you said? Rhonda mentioned that on the rules that, that we kind of know it because we'll feel off, we'll feel icky, we'll mm -hmm. feel whatever. And I kind of called that a barometer. And um i you know sometimes and that was my question is what happens if your barometer is stuck or not <laughs> or not functioning but but truly when you talk about the path it's all about going love god love your neighbor know he's god and he seems pretty good with us if we stay in that you know like hitch I just had a uh, Shannon was sweet and pulled up the verse in the Bible. It's in Second Chronicles, so I know that this is plucking a verse out of a greater context. So you can have the context, um, Pastor Gail. But it's a Second Chronicles seven fourteen, where I feel like mm -hmm. it's constantly Quite quoted, cool. especially yeah. in the states right now with all that's going on, even towards LGBTQ community. But it says, "My people who are called by my name, if they will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven, will forgive their sin." and will heal their land, but I don't see, and I will punish them. So back to like the, is punishment a piece of it? That is interesting that even in that, there's multiple verses al along those lines in the New and Old Testament, and nowhere do I see. And then I'll quick punish, I'll, I'll spank you real quick. I did want to um, go back and, and, and circle back and say, I don't want a Catholic bash, partly um, because, <laughs> because, um, I have also spent a great deal of time in that um, denomination, and there is great beauty, there is great strength, and there is sure. great goodness there. And mm -hmm. the, the rituals that they get bashed for all the time are not bad in and of themselves. We have rituals in the Protestant tradition. Sure. Um, and and so, I'm sorry uh, if I presented it that way. No, no, I was no, saying no, this Brian, is not a that was my reference. Yeah, no, yeah. this is not a this is my reference. Of, of any that has been said, um, this is more, I, I am sensitive to the fact that some people who listen online are Catholic and no. I want them to not feel like um, they're second best in any way. And I want to no. point out that, you know, the Catholic church itself repudiated what's called indulgences, which is selling yeah. forgiveness in, you know, for in return for money or doing things. However, the priests do when you go to confession that they do give you 
things to do, you know, penances. Um, Mary, they don't others, sell yeah. it to you anymore, but they do give you penances right. to do. <laughs> I don't find that different than the, the um, sacrificial system that um, Moses set up in which someone who was unclean mm -hmm. or had sinned or whatever could, when they recognize that, bring gifts to the Lord and sacrifice right. them as it's, I think it's more of an outward sign to ourselves and, uh, to, and to our community that we are repenting and changing direction. We are confessing. I think, in fact, the, um, to get back to Julia's point about healing, I think the Protestant tradition made a huge mistake when we, when we lopped off confession from part of mm -hmm. our regular um, church life uh, because there is great healing in confession. Again, if you, if, you're, if you are giving away, if you're giving your money or your time or your property, that is some sort of pain that you're kind of inflicting on yourself. Uh, so you are, you're demonstrating maybe to everybody else, but also to yourself that, that this repentance is true in some way. And you're and absolutely Rhonda right. About also the, the idea that what you, hopefully the things you would be giving away would be the things you had been relying on instead of the Lord. Yeah. Right. Your idols, maybe. Yes. Yeah. Anything, that, anything that you had placed your trust in instead of the Lord. Lord. Yeah. And, and Rhonda did say that when we were talking about that. And you're right. I should have prefaced my stuff and I apologize. I, I hope I didn't seem Catholic bashing. I'm saying that was know. my reference for, but Rhonda did even say that sometimes like a 10 Hail Mary is an accountability thing because sometimes it's one thing like Ahab did to say, okay, I repent. And in that moment you truly repent, but what are you going to practice moving forward that keeps you straight yeah. on that path? Yeah. And, and to, and to look at those, the Hail Marys, some of those things as, as an accountability and, and a reminder, a reference that you seeded in your brain. It's just like when we learn things, we talk about repetition, you know, so we did have that concept or talk. Yeah. You, you also, when you're, when you're doing Hail, you know, the rosary, for me, I can clear my mind of all the other garbage that's in the house yeah. or all the other garbage filtering into your life all the time. I'm sitting right there with God. Yeah why I do it and I haven't been Catholic since I was 16 but <laughs> I still keep that part because it's helpful to me to connect yes and th that's what the Hail Mary is for is to um, have a connection to the Blessed Mother who is part of the whole package Catholic package if you want to mm -hmm. say that and it's it's there to help you connect with God. Um, so it's praying with like basically another friend mm -hmm. to help you um, make repair that relationship that you damaged because you sinned. So it should never be considered a punishment, but an opportunity to strengthen, repair that relationship. Okay. Uh, I do love, I also love that Woody brought us back to the idea of giving up and giving away and humbling ourselves because the whole context of um, what Jesus was talking about, um, you know, was when he told a rich young man, go give your money away. And the, and the guy said, oh man, I don't do know that. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And something else that hit me today is when what he said, the whole Old Testament is basically when Jesus said, love God, love others as you love yourself. He also said, love yourself. Yes. When I, when I tell people to use that as their yardstick, I always present it as three things, you know, because we so and often. I never, realized, I never realized that. I just realized it today that God <laughs> says, love yourself. Because I have a horrible time of doing that. Absolutely, because you are precious. You got, you know, God, you know how women always marry men they think they can fix? 
God okay, man, don't say a word. Yes, God, God <laughs> made a people in whom he saw who they could be. That we are, when we marry someone we think we can fix, we are simply being in the image of God. There is always that hope that we see beyond what, what there is now to what that person was created to be. And that's how God sees us. And that's how we need to see ourselves. It's not that we should love our, the ugly parts of ourselves. You don't have to love, love the ugly parts. You know, God will love those parts for you. The, the, the thing to do is to ask God, what is the beauty that you see in me? Because I can't see it. Mm -hmm. yeah. And God will be faithful to show that to you because God knows you as intimately as a lover. Do you all have any more thoughts on repentance or anything we've talked about today? We're at the end of our time. Yeah, if you could highlight a little bit of, I, I'm finding a hard time. You know, I know when we're off track to repentance and I, I, I feel like the Holy Spirit will kind of tug in my heart, will show me um, so I can humble and make right with somebody else. But I think I'm having a hard time when accepting when somebody else is not seeing that they're off track <laughs> and, and, and she's trusting. Not, she's not talking about me guys <laughs> and, and, just, yeah. and resting in that. How do I trust God in the midst of feeling mm -hmm. like somebody else is off track, but they don't see that they're off track. Yes. Like that has been a really challenge for me this last year. Well, Jesus talked about that too. He, um, he gave us the, the, the three rules, love God, love your neighbor, love yourself. But then he answered your exact question. He said, the way you will know that is by the fruit. Just look at the fruit. Is the fruit of your life peace, patience, kindness, self-control, gentleness, loving kindness, compassion, mercy? Are these the impulses of your heart? And is this the result of your actions? Is this where your decisions lead? And is this what you are causing to happen in other people? Are you creating an environment in which someone else feels compassion and love and kindness and self-control, respect, okay? The, I'm not saying you can't have boundaries. You can definitely have boundaries, <laughs> okay? But all you need to do is look at the fruit and look at the fruit in the other person's life as a result of their own choices is the result of their choice, strife, envy, hatred, division, backbiting, low self-esteem, cutting, addiction, and death. Those are the two fruits. Now you may find, you know, they tend to travel in groups because those fruits are fruit of a tree that is rooted in a reality that is either God or not God. And that's what Jesus was saying. Follow God, love God, love each other, love yourself and keep your eye open for the fruit because if you're, you will know which way you're going because this collection of fruit will tell you. And if you do find yourself having followed a false teacher, say, who has led you into a church, let's say, that is teaching you to do things and believe things that are causing people to be destroyed, Jesus said, don't feel trapped. Don't be afraid. 
I will come get you. Just call on me and I will come get you. If I can add one thing to that, I, I believe that the best way to create those fruits in other people is to create them in ourselves. Absolutely. We're not responsible for other people's choices. We are responsible for what we say and do towards them, you know? And that comes out of our heart. What comes out of our mouth has begun in our heart. Somebody famous in the New Testament said that. <laughs> but Erica, were you asking how you deal with people who have the wrong low-hanging fruit? Is that what you were asking? Well, they wouldn't see it as having the bad fruit. They would put the shift on me for having the bad fruit. So it, it becomes a, we're, we're both in a state, I mean, I, I guess I'm, I'm trying to figure out if there is something I'm doing to cause the bad fruit because they would be quick to say I'm causing the bad fruit, but in, in how I'm perceiving it, I feel like they're causing the bad fruit. So we're almost like in the same position where you have two different opinions, you have two different beliefs, and yet you're almost waiting for the other person to acknowledge the hurt and neither one is ready to. Both sides are strongly believing that they're following and seeking God and hearing, strongly believing they're following and hearing from God. Yes, and that's where you, you really have to stay rooted in your truth. In other words, look at the fruit that you're looking at and determine, is that fruit attached to my tree or their tree? <laughs> you know? And, and, and you're not responsible for the fruit that's attached to their tree. You are responsible for the fruit attached to your tree. You are responsible for staying connected to your root. Now they can look at your fruit and call it bad. That happens all the time in, in life. We can just read the news and find people, uh, you know, telling us alternative facts, right? Um, just because they call your fruit bad does not mean it's bad. You can look at your fruit and know whether it falls in roughly into the grouping of peace, patience, kindness, goodness, self-control, wholeness, and life, or whether it generally falls into the low self-esteem, destructiveness, divisiveness, hatefulness coming from you. If someone else is spewing hatefulness towards you, that's their fruit, not your fruit. And if, if someone who thinks they are good and thinks they're being kind and generous and good is doing to you something that from your point of view, as it lands, is not in the least bit loving, not in the least bit kind, is crushing your soul, is causing you to doubt the Lord, you know, to doubt yourself, to doubt who you are, that attacks your identity, then no matter what they call that, that is not love. And buying into that is not loving yourself. Amen. And it is hard when it is someone you love and respect and who has been someone who's taught you right from wrong. It gets very hard. You know, just remember that these fruit come in clusters. And it's pretty easy to look at the cluster. And if that other person is confusing you, then stop and take a look at who you are and where you are rooted and what is your fruit truly in the eyes of the Lord. Not what someone else says it is but the witness of the Holy Spirit in your life says it is. Yeah. Does anybody have something to add to that? Erica's question is not an easy one. It's hard to live through. I think the criteria is easy. I think it's hard to live through. 
it's the hardest thing in the world to receive hatefulness and not have it generate hatefulness in yourself back toward them. Or self-doubt, right? Or self-doubt, yeah. Mm -hmm. And to change the mechanisms in lifelong built-in, you know, exchanges. It when you realize, you know, where you've been gardening. <laughs> so. yeah. But I trust Jesus. I trust God. I believe, Erica, that if you are wrong and rooted wrongly, Jesus will come get you. I don't for a minute believe that you are rooted wrongly, <laughs> but you can be, you can rest assured that this is on Jesus. All we are called to do is to try to face towards God. If he can work with King Ahav, <laughs> he can work with us, right? I love you. Bye, Bye everybody. Guys. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.